hello, welcome back to my channel. Today is the start of a 24 hour reading vlog, wherein I'm going to read Throne of Glass all in 24 hours. Honestly, more likely it's gonna be 12 hours, but today just felt like the perfect time to do this. It's kind of ugly outside and Hayden is gonna be gone tonight. So I figured me and you could cozy up with Throne of Glass and get into all of the spoilery thoughts, all of my feelings about this book. If you didn't know, I am rereading the entire Throne of Glass series over this next year of 2021, doing live shows over on Instagram. But my hope is with this video series, I can give y'all all of my thoughts. So if you're ever curious, like what did Chandler think of that series? you can come back and revisit these videos, or if you just want some delightful background noise, I'm here for that. Hoping that this one is going to be more of a success than the Assassin's Blade was. I feel like I didn't have any like super fun, juicy thoughts, but I think with the first real book in the series, I'm gonna have a lot to say, especially about Kale and Dorian, is that his name? The other male love interest, uh, and Selena, the whole like love triangle situation. Also Selena's dumbassery in the little like, you know, competition. I don't know, I I'm very, I'm very excited. We're gonna stay up, we're gonna finish this book, and it's gonna be a good time. Did I change out of my fancy dress? You bet your ass I did. 21 pages into this book and the first thing that is just astounding to me is that Selena is getting out of a situation where she was in slavery. She was like in salt mines. How do you mine salt? Anyway, she's been asked by Dorian, the crown prince, to enter a competition to become an assassin or like handle the king's business. You know what I mean? Like you win and oh my god, you get to be an assassin. And instead of um, having to be a salt slave, a salt slave... A slave in the salt mines, she can help the king and then she'll have her freedom in four to six business years or something like that. But what's interesting to me is that she is brought out of slavery and instead of being like grateful, she's just like bitchy and mad and like I get it, I totally get it, but also I just think it's funny that her like first thought whenever she is brought into these nice rooms and bathed and given food, she's just sad that she doesn't have boobies anymore, so... <laughs> already off to a great start. Also kind of stupid, but I was trying to read some of the like place names in this book. In my head, the salt mines are Indovie because it's an I-E-R ending, but when I looked it up, it's an Endovier. Endovier. The word that looks like airily is Aurelia. I'm having a hard time trying to read these in my head, kind of like when I was little and I thought the name Carlisle was pronounced Carlisle. I'm just, I'm struggling at the moment. I never had any issues the first time I read this book with the, with the names, like the names of the people, like Kale, like that was like easy for me, but for some reason the place names are kind of fucking me up. Anyway, I'm not having the worst time, so that's encouraging. It is, you know what, let's keep track of the time as we do this because that could be fun. It's 3.30. I would like to get to page 100 sometime. So I'm 100 pages into Throne of Glass. It is 7.59 p.m. and respectfully, nothing's fucking happened. Selena is not pissing me off as much as she did the first time that I read this book. I think I've only read this book one time. To be frank, I can't remember a lot of the first part of this book. I, for some reason, thought it started like very quickly after she got offered this like deal. I didn't really remember them actually traveling to Rifthold. So where I'm at right now, Selena has, you know, taken on this quest to become the champion of Adder Adderlin. I want to say Adderlon, but it's Adderlin apparently. She is trying to keep her head down. She has made a new friend in this princess who is named Nehemia. I did know that. I do like their relationship. I will say that's probably been the most interesting thing so far. Other than that, not like vibing super hard with any of the characters. I feel like they have Dorian in this book be this like kind of player interesting type when to be honest, he's just like sad boy. Like that is who Dorian is as a character. So I'm kind of just like, the characterization is just strange, I guess. It's weird seeing him here when that's like not how I think of him. And then Kale is just being who he is, you know what I mean? Just very bland, very lackluster, giving me nothing. Not to shit on people with brown hair and brown eyes because I have those. He's described like so blandly and I feel like it really kind of sums up his personality too because he's boring as fuck. I am surprised at how little has happened in these first hundred pages. We haven't even had the first like challenge yet and I kind of forgot that the king isn't even at any of these trials so that's interesting. I will say I I'm pretty sure I mentioned like a couple seconds ago because you know that is who I am. I, I forget everything I say that Selena is pissing me off less this time around than she did previously. And that actually is true because I feel like we are getting some seeds planted that she isn't a terrible assassin. She did, you know, scope out her room when she first got to the castle and was like, yo, I don't see any weapons. Let me break these hairpins into jagged shards that I could stab someone with. So, you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate that that groundwork has been set, um, laid, whatever. And then on top of that, I like that she noticed a word, W-Y-R-D. Do you ever like picture letters in your head, but you like can't verbalize. Anyway, she found a word, a rune type, you know, thing 
and she was asking Kale what they were. He said he didn't know. And I just didn't remember that being something that was like at play so early on in the book. Nothing has really been explored but besides her just saying like, hey, what is that? But I know that that's going to be playing a part as we as we continue. So that is where I'm at. To be frank, I want a bowl of Lucky Charms and then I want to get into this like even deeper, give you all the juicy gossip, all the juicy facts about this book or opinions. There's no facts really, it's all opinions, but I did kind of fuck myself to be honest, starting this late and then like taking a three hour break to, I mean, to be fair, I was like budgeting. So like we love financial fiscal responsibility, but I need to get back into it because I want to, I want to post this video tomorrow and <laughs> we'll see if that happens, but I I'm gonna. I'm sort of starting to remember why Selena is such a dumbass. I think we've had three trials so far, and in each one, Selena just hasn't been that intelligent. But that being said, I feel like had she been more intelligent, the story would have been less interesting. So I think the first trial is like a marksmanship thing. They have to fire arrows into bullseyes. Kale tell Selena if she wants to win this competition, she should stay low and just, you know, be in the middle of the pack until the very end, until she can, like, kill the, the main boss, the last boss, the final boss, Kane or whatever, like, the biggest competitor. And Selena, in theory, is, like, fine with this, but obviously in practice she's not, because, like, that's fucking boring. So during the marksmanship competition, she ends up hitting the bullseye so impressively that everybody is just like in awe, in shock and awe, but it's not satisfying to her at the end of the day because she doesn't really feel like she won anything. So that was like the first red flag, right? Like the first time that she's being kind of stupid and like it's kind of worrisome. I'm gonna put this down so I can gesticulate. Then we have the competition where they're supposed to be scaling the walls of the castle and whoever gets to the flag first is the winner. Whoever ends up being the last person down the, the building or whatever loses. And someone that Selena has just barely become acquaintances with ends up trying to like slip, not trying, ends up forcibly slipping down the building and is going to meet an untimely death. But of course, Selena saves the day, makes sure that this person doesn't die. And in doing so, she ends up coming in second to last place in this competition. So I guess in that way, it's kind of good because she's sort of listening to Kale. But at the same time, she didn't really keep her head down for that one because she brought attention to herself by saving this guy. Obviously, I think a main criticism of this book that I've seen over and over again is that Selena is someone who is kind of dumb and doesn't really listen, doesn't make the best decisions. And I would agree with that. But again, I feel like if she had just kept her head down for all of these competitions, like how interesting would that be to read about, right? So I can't really fault Sarah J Maas for doing it the way she's done it. And it's clear that she is trying to make Selena someone who does have skill. So at least that's like kind of fun and interesting to watch. And I do think that the skill Selena exhibits seems to be greater than that of the people around her. So like, I, I do believe, I guess, that she is this famed assassin. In other news, <laughs> we have gotten more hints as to kind of what the words maybe mean. And by words, I mean W-Y-R-D-S. We find out that they are part of like an ancient magic or religion. And Nehemia says that you should just stay away from those and Selena is obviously very curious. She also at one point discovers a secret tunnel in her bedchamber. And while she doesn't find anything like particularly interesting in the tunnel, that night she ends up having a dream about the tunnel and someone that might be residing there. So there's some old ass way in the past monarch named Elena. And Elena is telling Selena that there are evils afoot, ancient evils, and that she needs to be careful and try to eliminate them at all costs. So kind of interesting. And I think it's bringing a slightly more zesty take to the story. Story. Is it inventive? No. Is it groundbreaking? Absolutely not. But I do think it's adding just a little bit something more than just like a typical trials type fantasy because I feel like that's very common in fantasy and like had it just been that I feel like we would have all been bored. This is at least bringing in a little bit of flavor and spice and it is setting the tone and the mood for the other books which I think is important because I feel like it would have come out of complete left field if the whole like magic component of the books didn't come in in this one so it's not bad like I'm, I'm enjoying it so far. I think my main disappointment at this point in the book also did I say I'm 200 pages into this? Did I say that it's 9 56 p.m.? It is those things also, my forehead's deliciously shiny. Back to the topic at hand. I think the only thing at this point that is kind of irritating me is Kale and Dorian. Neither of them seem to be real contenders as love interests, and I just, I'm not loving either of them. Like, <laughs> Dorian, kind of a pompous asshole, but like not even in a very convincing or interesting way. Like, he doesn't have this damaged past that we know about so far, at least, to make him like have any sort of depth. Like, he's just surface level kind of bland. And then Kale, we found out a little bit about his backstory. Like, he gave up his title so 
he could be part of the King's Guard or whatever. But so fucking what? I don't really understand him, and I also don't understand why he is such an asshole to Selena for no reason. I don't know, like, I can do, like, a grumpy sunshine trope thing, but there needs to be a reason behind it. And so far, Kale's not very convincing. He's just annoying. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at with this book. I think what I'm gonna do is get to page 300 tonight. I'll update y'all tomorrow on that. And then I'll finish the final 100 pages tomorrow and we will finish out the vlog. It'll still be 24 hours. In fact, it'll be less than that. So I'm pretty impressed with my progress. Don't know about y'all. Also, did y'all like that little like Lucky Charms montage? I'm trying to get like slightly more creative with my vlogs. I feel like they're kind of boring just like me sitting here and talking at you. Well, I don't know if that really added anything, but I'll be back tomorrow morning bright and early. If we can hear any construction noise, too damn bad because it's been going on for two damn hours and I have not been able to talk to y'all about Throne of Glass. I'm like 300 pages in as I told y'all that I would be this morning. I can't say that much has happened since we last spoke, although I did leave out some crucial information last time we spoke. So a lot of people are just dying, winding up dead, and their bodies are gruesomely teared apart and they're just kind of found around the castle. And we find out that everybody that has died so far is a competitor during this competition. And if anything, that is making Selena's life easier. So that's just adding like some additional tension, I think, to the story. Like obviously these people are winding up dead and that is good for the competition, but obviously like bad because Selena is also a competitor. So she's like, mm, a little suspicious, a little worrisome. So she's kind of trying to figure out that mystery. She's trying to figure out what Queen Elena, the deceased queen, meant by there's danger afoot. She's assuming that has something to do with the people winding up dead. And then things are also kind of mysterious surrounding Princess Nehemia. So under Selena's bed, she finds a ton of word marks in kind of like a swirl pattern. And then she's walking in the hallway one day and I believe Nehemia gives her a piece of paper with a word mark. And Selena's like, oh my God, is Nehemia, does she have something to do with the deaths of these people? Because a lot of the people that have been found have word marks like written in blood, I think could be wrong here. I could be just like making shit up at this point. There's word marks found by the dead bodies. So and things are things are heating up, things are getting more interesting, and things are kind of coming together. We have the word marks, but they're not just this like random thing anymore. They definitely are something that has power in this world, and Selena needs to figure out what that is. But that being said, not much has happened in the past hundred pages. We basically just have Selena going to this Yule ball, Yule Miss ball. She ends up kind of sneaking in because she's not allowed to go there because for some fucking reason Kale won't let her go, even though all of the other competitors for the trials are allowed to go to these balls. So she ends up kind of showing up in a mask because it's a mask ball and she's like, oh, I can get away with it. Dances with Dorian. She kind of pisses Kale off, but he is kind of sweet to her at the end of it. I don't know. I feel like Sarah J. Mass is trying to build this tension between Dorian and Kale and Selena, and I'm just not really buying it. I kind of understand the character dynamics here, and I feel like this happens sometimes in books. Like, you have two guy friends. One is a little bit more gruff and mysterious, and the other one's kind of like the playboy fun type, and they're both kind of competing for the affections of the same girl, which is kind of what we have here. But I just don't feel like either of the characters, Kale or Dorian, are very convincing in their respective roles. Like I don't find Dorian to be this like amazing player. So that's kind of where I'm at. But like I said, yeah, just like not much has happened. There haven't actually, I don't think been any trials. There actually, there was one trial in the past hundred pages. It was a poisons trial and Selena actually cheated on that one. She was given a hint by Queen Elena on how she can win this trial or how she can not lose the trial. I mean, that's, that's really all that matters is that she's not sent home or sent back to the salt mines in this case. That trial has happened. Nothing else really around the trials has happened. It's interesting because I remember so much of what happened, but also so little. Because I read this back before I started YouTube in, I want to say 2017, and I don't think I've read it again since. No, no, no. Actually, I have. I have. I think I read it in 2019 as well. But I'm just like not really remembering how this book's going to end. And I'm wondering if there's going to be like brutal trials at the end. I know there is because I think she has to like defeat the final boss, Kane. But it's interesting. Oh, I did forget actually <laughs> one component of this book that's kind of interesting. Eh, maybe debatable. Caltaine as a character. So Caltaine is this courtier and she has her sights set on Dorian. She wants to marry Dorian and she's upset that Lillian aka Selena is trying to get into the prince's good graces and like, you know, win him or whatever, even though that's not really what Selena cares about. And where I just left off, Caltaine is showing that she might have more behind her dead eyes than we were led to believe. Like she might have something to do with the things that have been going on. We don't know for sure, but we're kind of suspicious of her. She's kind of trying to get in bed with Duke Parrington, who's like this kind of gross old man. So she can like work her way up the ladder and or like get with Dorian. And we know Parrington's up to no goods so for like, does she know what's going on? She doesn't seem to, but also, I don't know, there's a lot of play here. And I'm curious to see kind of where her character goes. I do know her eventual fate because I have read some of these other books, 
but I can't really remember like what part she plays in this particular book and I'm curious to see because obviously like we wouldn't have her POV in here if it wasn't important so I'm curious to see kind of like what she has to do with the end of this book so as we go into the you know 400 page mark as we go into the last portion of this book there's much to think about hopefully things get more interesting will they debatable but fingers crossed they do in typical Sarah J Mass fashion the last 100 pages of this book were really the bulk of the plot and the bulk of the setup for the other books so I'm gonna briefly run you through what exactly happened in these 100 pages and then I'll let you know like how I felt about it because I feel like my feelings about this book are stronger than they have been in the past and not necessarily in a negative sense. So first off, Selena ends up finding Cain in the tunnels summoning demons. So now she is kind of aware of who is using these word marks. She still thinks that Nehemia might have something to do with this. She's not entirely sure because obviously Nehemia knows about word marks, but she finds Cain in these tunnels. He summons a demon and he tries to send this demon after Selena. She ends up um, defeating the demon but getting bitten before she does do that. And then she is saved by Nehemia in the tunnels. Nehemia basically heals her from this demon bite, which could have killed her. And now Selena has this feeling that Cain is willing to do anything it takes to win this competition. I will say I'm surprised that her level of suspicion didn't necessarily go up after these events happened. Like you would assume that after something like this happens, you would be like, okay, shit, I need to like watch out. But the only thing that she really does is warn one of the people that she saved. I say one of the people. She warns the one person that she saved during this competition that he should probably just leave in case he wants to, I don't know, not die. But Selena doesn't really heed the, I don't want to say warning that this like demon summoning was, but she knows that she can't really escape, I guess. So I guess it sort of makes sense as to like why she behaved the way that she did. But she just doesn't really seem to think that anything is really going to come of this, I guess. Or like she doesn't assume that this is going to play any part in how her trial goes or whatever. So anyway, now that Knox, the guy that she warned, is gone, they have canceled the final trial and they're going straight into the duels. So there's four people, there's going to be like two sets of duels, and then whoever wins obviously does the final duel. And during the final duel, or I guess right before the final duel, Selena is poisoned by Caltaine at the instruction of Lord Parrington because he's like, I'm going to ensure that my champion, I'm going to ensure that Kane ends up winning this competition, so let's just ensure that with some poison. And since Selena is not great with poisons, and since she needed help with that particular um, trial, she ends up not suspecting any thing. She drinks some wine and then she goes and tries to fight Kane and she ends up seeing demons and shit while this like final duel happens. She is obviously, I don't say outnumbered, but she is overpowered by Kane because she is poisoned and he's really fucking strong. So she is dealing with this. She's also like seeing shit because the poison is having her kind of like hallucinate. But luckily, of course, Selena has the power of Elena and anime on her side and Elena is somehow summoned we don't know at the beginning like how that's happened, but Elena is summoned and she somehow siphons all of this poison out from Selena. Selena is able to defeat Kane. Yay. That's kind of the end of the duel. So we do find out afterwards that Nehemia is the one that summoned Elena and Nehemia does know how to use word marks. That's apparently something that has been lost over time and it is a form of magic that you can use kind of when all else fails as Nehemia describes, but that is essentially how she was using word marks and the word marks that Selena found under her bed were put there by Nehemia. So Nehemia did have some stuff to do with the word marks, but she wasn't using them in like a bad way like Kane was. And during this whole ordeal, we have Dorian being exceedingly concerned for Selena. And at one point he says that he loves her, not like verbalizing it, but he says it in his head. And I'm just like, y'all have not spent enough time together for you to have those deep feelings of affection, but okay, interesting. And I, I think the end of the book is probably the weakest part, frankly. We get some insight into what's going to happen in the next book with the interactions between Duke Parrington and the king in that they're trying to like mind control people, but I think really the weakest part is the interactions again between Selena and Dorian and Kale. So Selena, after she wins and is officially kind of the king's champion, I guess, or king's assassin is really what she's going to be. She tells Dorian that she can't be with him because it just wouldn't make sense. She wants to get her freedom after these four years. Why should she dally with a prince? Like it doesn't really make sense for either of them. And he's like, okay, that's fine. And then Kale comes to her room or like they start talking again and and there's this hint that there might be something there that there might be a relationship there they do have this like weird hugging situation that happens after kale makes his first kill and feels really bad about it kale's inner monologue just basically says like the next four years should be interesting i don't know if it'll be enough with her and it just felt very weird and very rushed like going from having dorian being the main love interest to having kale be the love interest at the very end of the story with little to no prompting it just felt sort of strange anyway that's the end of the book i know i talked 
very quickly about it, but a lot of shit happens in that last hundred pages. I think I've probably left some things out, but Selena knows that there's magic. Selena knows that she's going to have to kill for the king unless she wants all of her friends and family to die. Not that she has family, but all of her friends and friends' family. She doesn't want her friends' family to die. So she has to be obedient. That's it. That's the book. Now we can talk about how I felt about this book as a whole. I feel like my feelings are a little different after reading it for a third time. I think the first time I was actually going back and looking at my Goodreads review, I said that I thought this was just like completely average and kind of boring and just whatever. Like it wasn't good, but it wasn't terrible. And I do kind of still stand by that. But I think what really stood out to me the most this time around was how much this book was a setup for the other ones. Like it doesn't feel like a well-rounded, completed story. There are elements of this book that could have made it feel very completed, but nothing was fleshed out enough to make it feel that way. Like the trial aspect of the story, that could have been like a very well-rounded way to make the book feel satisfying. And yes, of course, at the end, we do have Selena becoming the king's champion, but I don't feel like it really felt impactful. It didn't feel like Selena had to overcome very much to kind of get to that place. And obviously she's like this badass assassin and like she should have won in the first place, but none of the trials felt that impressive or difficult or interesting to read about. Hell, I think uh, Farrah's experience in A Court of Thorns and Roses at the very end of it was more impactful than the trials in this book. Like, it just didn't feel like it had much bearing on the story, even though that was, like, what the story was supposed to be about. And then the love interests, I feel like, were very weak in this story compared to other Sarah J. Mass books. I feel like Tamlin had more personality and zest than Dorian or Kale, which says a lot because Tamlin didn't really have much, like, flavor in any of those books. So yeah, I don't know. It, it's interesting to me how much this was a setup. Again, those trials. I mean, yeah, they do get us to the place where Selena is, you know, the champion at the end and like we're gonna see what that is like in the next books, but I just wanted it to feel like a more complete story. And instead, I feel like almost everything here is left with a lot of question marks at the end. I wanted at least one thing to be kind of like resolved and feel good. And again, I guess you could say that that's the trials, but I didn't, I didn't really feel like that, or at least it wasn't strong enough to make it feel like, yes, this is a good story. And I think that's challenging, honestly, in any fantasy series. Like you do want to answer some questions in each book, but also keep it open-ended enough to where it feels like there is a necessity for more books in the series. So I I guess I can't really fault her for that. And since I believe this is her first novel, I guess I can kind of overlook that, but it didn't make for a very satisfying read. That's where I'm at. But I will say that the series does get more interesting as it goes on. I've read, I think the first three, potentially four books in the series, I cannot remember for sure. And I enjoyed each one progressively more. So I feel like having this one just be kind of like a two and a half, maybe three star read is okay because I am gearing up for more exciting things to come. I'll be back next month to read Crown of Midnight. I think that's the second book, maybe, potentially. Thanks so much for watching. Love you guys so much and uh, until next Sunday.